Hi there, everybody, and welcome back to our journey through World War I. As you can see, today I'm not covering an Epic History TV video, but a video from one of the best channels, or maybe the best channel, I would say, that covers the topic of World War I, and it's the channel called The Great War. Please check it out if you don't know them. Uh, they cover every aspect of World War I. They have also special series on different topics like this one. And I talked about sharpshooters in the last video that I covered and I thought it, it would be interesting to take on this topic because I think that sharpshooters and snipers don't get the recognition in the First World War like in the Second World War. And I think in general the Second World War kind of overshadows the First World War. But they, uh, the snipers and sharp, sharpshooters, I think get also overshadowed by the different new technologies that were implemented in the war, like uh, biological warfare, tanks, airplanes, mass bombardment by artillery, and different stuff. So uh, I wanted to present you this video and talk about things uh, in this video. So without further ado, if you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, and tomorrow we're of course going to continue with the Epic History TV series on World War One. Okay, let's see. It's quiet. The battle has died down for a moment and the men are relaxing in the trenches as much as they are able to. The captain walks over to you with a smile on his face and begins to tell you a funny story when he suddenly pauses. His face goes Ooh. blank and he crumples dead to the ground, shot in the head by an enemy sniper. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about snipers. I love, I love the setup. I love the setup in, in their videos. It's so cool. During the First World War. By the fall of 1914, the war of motion on the Western Front had degenerated into stalemate, and the individual battles could last for months. There were hours and even days of lulls between the surges and counter-surges, and a main feature of these lulls was the single man silently observing the enemy trenches with his rifle. Okay, let's guess, let's guess here. Uh, I don't know about the hat, it looks a little bit French. I would say, I don't know. <laughs> the rifle l looks actually pretty similar to the Russian Mosin Nagant, or? So I would say it's Russian. Or, what would you say? What would you say? I would say it, it's a Russian dude. A Russian now, sniper. Germany, Austria-Hungary and France went to war in July 1914 with Jäger or Chasseur units, light infantry with a long tradition of woodland combat, who were skilled in camouflage, observation, and patience. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who don't know German that well, Jäger is actually the equivalent in English for hunter. So of course they recruited a lot of people from the rural areas who used to be hunters. But one interesting thing about the recruitment in Austria-Hungary and the creation parts, I went through the archives and I found out that actually they you know, like had a standing army, but as the number of men dwindled, the first ones they started to rec recruit were actually policemen because they were equipped with weapons and they no knew how to handle it, handle them. So it's quite interesting. And then you had also, of course, uh, you needed to replace the policemen that went to the front and then civilians filled the position of police, but it's a, it's a different topic. And then you can see the civilian policemen future policemen, always drunk, doing stupid things in the, in the different Croatian cities. But it's a different topic, but an interesting one. And Britain, on the other hand, entered the war without doctrines for individual marksmanship and sharpshooters and without telescopic sights for their rifles. And this soon was a big issue. The German army issued a lot of commercial hunting rifles made by Walter and Mauser to the infantry in 1914. They were not of a high military standard and had an effective accuracy of only 300 meters, 900 feet. But they worked well enough for the moment, especially where the trenches were very close to each other. By the end of the year, though, they had supplied over 15,000 Gewehr 98 rifles with telescopic sights and a range of a kilometer. Okay, so maybe the guy was German in the last picture. <laughs> 
Three. Th Th this looks li li like the rifle. Thousand feet. Well, a little bit more, but you can do the that math. That the guy yourself. had. These were issued to the best marksman of a battalion, who was often someone who had been a forest guard, hunter, or policeman in civilian life. These men most often sniped alone, although they were allowed to work in pairs. They had no fixed location and could even go into no man's land. Their sights and binoculars, made by world masters like Zeiss, Goertz, or Hensoldt, gave them a significant advantage over the British in trench warfare, who had pretty much none of these weapons at this time. On one day, in one trench segment early in 1915, the British lost 18 men to German sniper fire, and a single sniper could easily score 40 or more kills before he was Boy. dealt with. And being dealt with at that time usually meant shelling the area with field guns since there was no real counter sniping ability. Yeah, and just hope for it the wasn't best. wasn't just on the Western Front either. At Gallipoli, Turkish snipers, though not often equipped with telescopic sights, were masters of camouflage and shot from behind bushes, tall grass, or rock formations, making life hell and inflicting heavy casualties on the Anzacs on the beaches and lower slopes below. Uh, I know about the guy, uh, he was called Abdul the Terrible. He was fighting on the Ottoman side, and but he was actually taken down by... Um, I think a Canadian or an Anzac uh, uh, a sniper, Sam something. The Anzacs, for their part, had an immensely eh. gifted sniper there in the person... He, he, uh, Billy, <laughs> Sam, Singh. Okay, Billy Singh. Yeah, he, he took out um, Abdul the Terrible. ...of Billy Singh, a Chinese-Australian marksman nicknamed the Assassin. His official kill tally there was 150, but there are estimates as high as 300 men killed. One of Whoa. the first British officers who determined to... Then the nickname Assassin isn't just a nickname, then it's a fact. ...to improve British sharpshooting was Major Hesketh Pritchard of British Intelligence. He was a big game hunter and not only brought his own telescopic hunting rifles to the front lines, but bought many others to outfit the troops. But you know, just giving a soldier a rifle with a telescope and saying, use this, was a death sentence. Amateurs were very quickly killed. Uh, just to talk about the military uh, evolution in the First World War and everything that happened prior to the First World War and the military in general. As you can see, everything that the military adopted and used in the First World War was prior to that used in, let's call it, civilian normal life. Biological weapons, because of medicine and development of medicine. Of course, the military and the different states try to develop something not only to help people, but also to kill people. Uh, and uh, also barbed wire. Bar barbed wire was actually used to uh, keep cattle safe and in one place, but then was used pretty extensively in the First World War to uh, barricade in front of the trenches so that the enemy troops cannot attack that easily so a lot of the things that were commonly used in normal civilian life were start or they always go into the military life. by the enemy they had no training in camouflage and soon gave their positions away or just put their rifles over the top of the parapets exposing themselves to german snipers those German snipers, by 1915, had a complex system of cover. They made their parapets deliberately uneven using sandbags and debris. Cool. They built metal shields with holes in them for firing through. They, they covered each other's flanks. They built concrete sniping posts. Hesketh Pritchard would have to educate the British if they were to have any chance of competing. With the help of Colonel Langford Lloyd, he established the first army sniping school and began taking recommended volunteers. There he taught the essentials of sniping. One, before even thinking about shooting, you must know your rifle far better than basic training taught. You couldn't just screw on a telescope and think you'd hit anything either. Sights were very sensitive and must be adjusted and corrected regularly. The focusing sleeve and object glass must be kept clean, and after six or 700 shots, the wear on the rifle ruined accuracy. Also, German snipers kept their rifles. The British had to give theirs to an NCO after their shift. That had to go. Two. Why? So British that the soldiers can more easily connect with the weapon? British snipers would work or in teams of two, one with a rifle and one with binoculars. In the trenches, 
Speed was the key, since a target only showed himself briefly. One bit of training was to have the man look through binoculars for 15 seconds and then write down everything he could remember. You want to know how memory. important this was? Old school Captured memory German play. snipers said they could identify British officers because they had skinnier legs than the enlisted men. There are hundreds and hundreds of our officers lying dead in France <laughs> whose death was solely due to the cut of their riding breeches. The observer's work was of immense value in the trenches. Three yeah, I mean, when you're a sniper, the more shots you fire, the more exposed you are because the enemy will eventually know what your position is. So, of course, you want to target the more valuable targets so officers and you know like people in higher commands one interesting thing about the germans is you can remember the germans at the beginning of the war they had the uh, pickelhaube it, it is called with the with the thing with the thing uh, on top of it i'm gonna put a picture on it but eventually in 1916 they adopted the stahlhelm which is known and also used in the second world war because of the pickelhelm when you go out of the trench, the, the pickle is already looking out so the enemy sharpshooter can already identify you before your eyes go out of the trench. So that was one of the reasons they eliminated the pickle helm and replaced it with the Stahlhelm, but also due to supply chain that was interrupted by the, by the British naval blockade. But Three. They learned the basics of camouflaging themselves and their rifles. Rifles could be wrapped in sandbags and lenses shaded from reflection. Wait, uh, here, this, where, there, I, I think it's this one. I don't know. For example, sniper lairs were effective, but once spotted, they were huge targets. Four. The shooting itself. You could not call yourself a sniper unless you could get off a shot within two seconds of sighting the target. Even a rookie wouldn't stick up his head for more than that long. Judging the wind or the distance was not only difficult, it was vital to success. And the smallest alteration to the ballistic could ruin the shot. On offense, the sniper's job was to target enemy machine gunners or forward artillery observers. And when yeah, a trench logical. was captured, he was to pin the enemy into the next trench to deter counterattacks. Mm. Hesketh Pritchard was proud of his work and even wrote in his book, Sniping in France, it was exactly as if a party of really capable sportsmen were shooting an area for big game, or better still, Scottish forest deer. Imagine these sportsmen replaced by careless and ignorant tourists. The ground would inevitably be maltreated. The wrong beast shot. Corey shot when the wind was unfavorable and all the deer stampeded into the next forest. Of course, in this case, the deer did not stampede, but shot back. By mid-1916, the British sniper was as skilled and experienced as his German counterpart. And German snipers consequently became more careful and shied away from what had earlier been without risk. Both sides now used lures and decoy dummy. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Ha, is he smoking a cigarette here? Is the doll smoking, smoking a cigarette? Heads to pinpoint enemy sniper positions and then take him out. The British even used elephant guns to shoot through the German metal sniper shields. It was a very dangerous game. If you're wondering, the sniper with the most kills in the war on all sides was the First Nation wait, soldier. Wait, wait, wait. Let's say uh, it was a French guy. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Or a German guy. Francis Pegamagabo, who fought for Canada. He had 300... <laughs> Far away, different continent. <laughs> 178 confirmed kills and captured over 300 more men during the war. Wow. I'm sure you noticed that most of the talk Props today to was about British sniping development, right? The French and Germans had similar schools, but they're not so well documented. And as to the Russians, I got nothing. Other nations had their own doctrines, but material is either unavailable or in languages we do not understand. Which is unfortunate, but that's how it is. If you know more about sniping on the Italian front, for example, get in touch with Flo, our social media manager. Today was just a brief introduction to the world. Ah, cool.
a tree. And just imagine not, not only the tree, but the no, man la no man's land in the First World War and the battlefield in general, so the trenches. They were devastated by artillery. There, there's always uh, trees and barbed wire and mud and everything. So it was perfect for camouflage and perfect for snipers. I'm not surprised that, that snipers and sharpshooters were used that common. World of the modern sniper, whose talent that they and patience were adopted have been vital to the conduct the not only war. of this war, but pretty much all of them ever since. Thanks to Marcus, our research assistant, for the research on this episode. If you wanna know more about the best sniper of World War I, click right here for our bio special about Francis Pegamagabo. For more great pictures of World War I snipers, follow us on Instagram and do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Okay, uh, should we do the best sniper in World War I as the next video and then go to the Epic History TV series? Let me know in the comment section below. Okay, uh, I saw this video, I think, two years ago. And then I remembered, as I said, when I uh, mentioned sharpshooters in the last video. So I thought it would be interesting to revisit this video and also to introduce this topic to you guys. Okay, uh, let me know all of your thoughts, opinions, corrections in the comment section below. I will appreciate it. If you don't know the channel, The Great War, visit them. They're, they're really a great channel and they uh, produce, I think, at least one video a week about the Great War, but they started to also cover the Second World War. Okay, if, you're wanna, uh, if you want to subscribe to this channel, just subscribe and yeah, get notified when new videos come out. <laughs> okay, until the next time. See ya.